meet in the middle a little bit. So uh, nonetheless, we're going to get into this Sunday school lesson today. And uh, this is lesson number nine of our quarter. And uh, today is August the 2nd, 2020. It's hard to believe. Uh, today's lesson is the priority of God's house. And our focus thought today is we must make the house of God a priority in our lives. And our lesson text is Second uh, uh, Chronicles chapter 24, verses 1 through 11. But our focus verse today is Second Chronicles chapter 24, verses 10 and 11. So we're going to read that first. And all of the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they had made an end. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought unto the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest officer came and emptied the chest, and took it, and carried it to his place again. Thus they did day by day, and gathered money in abundance. Our lesson text is Second Chronicles 24, starting with verse 1. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Zebiah of Beersheba. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all of the days of Jehoiada the priest. And Jehoiada took for him two wives, and he begat sons and daughters. And it came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. And he gathered together the priests and the Levites and said unto them, or said to them, Go out into the cities of Judah and gather of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year. And see that ye hasten the matter, howbeit the Levites hastened it not. And the king called for Jehoiada the chief and said unto him, Why hast thou not required of the Levites to bring in out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection, according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness. For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken up the house of God, and also all the dedicated things of the house of God, or house of the Lord, did they bestow upon Balaam. And at the king's commandment they made a chest and set it without at the gate of the house of the Lord. And they made a proclamation through Judah and Jerusalem to bring in to the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they had made an end. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought unto the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest officers came and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to its place again. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. And so we're going to teach today for a little while on the priority of God's house. Amen. So in this particular lesson, and we are going to deal with a little bit of, uh, of things throughout this lesson that's a little, uh, a little bit uh, you know, deeper, and you know, we're going to deal with some uh, issues of, uh, of adultery and, and some different things there. But the main uh, aspect of this particular lesson is the house of God. It's got to be a priority in each and every one of our lives. Amen. There are too many churches that are out there, and as sad as it is to say that are of truth, that uh, they do not uh, teach and minister the absoluteness of being in the house of God and taking care of the house of God and, and just, uh, you know, uh, putting it in the proper perspective of the Lord. In the culture connection, I don't really do the culture connection very often, but in this one, uh, I, I really felt like I wanted to bring it uh, bring it out. It says, on the 20th birthday, on his 20th birthday, Tom Marshall was drafted into the U.S. Army. He trained for eight weeks and was sent to England to train for eight more months. 
He saw his first combat during the invasion of northern France, better known as D-Day. He and his battalion landed on the beaches and worked their way through France, later following General Patton. They crossed through Belgium, Holland, and Germany. At the end of World War II, Tom watched as, uh, as displaced families struggled to find food and shelter. He recalled Paul's word describing the Macedonian call, Come over and help us. From that moment on, Tom was never the same. Tom returned home, met and married Lila, who had lost her first husband in the war. They started a family, and after a few years, the weight of God's call was heavy upon him. He and Lila, in response to the call for help, left a good job and sold all they had to go pastor. After his experience in war, Tom understood the importance of having a place to gather and worship, a place of safety and unity. People needed a church. Tom and Lila pastored over 40 years in five states, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina. He built five churches, two parsonages, one large educational building, and completed one church building that another minister started. To God be the glory, Tom and Lila Marshall, 2002. They discovered people were willing to work and sacrifice along them to have a place that was dedicated to God and ministry. We as the church, amen, we got to work together, bind together, pray together, amen, and do the things together that God would have us to do. To God be the glory. All right, in contemplating the topic, it says, near the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, Emperor Zudai, if y'all can speak Chinese, good, good for you. All right, uh, he was of China, was uh, revered as a living God, though he only lived from A.D. 360 to 1424. He was responsible for consolidating rule over China, pushing out Mongol invaders, extending the Great Wall, and commissioning the largest naval armada, armada, armada Jesus name, in world history until World War II. However, his greatest achievement was arguably the building of the Forbidden City in Beijing. When the Forbidden City was commissioned in A.D. 1407, it took over one million convicted criminals and conscripted slave laborers 10 years to gather the proper materials for the project. It took another 100,000 skilled craftsmen to finish the fine details of the city. No expense was spared for the residents of the palace and Forbidden City, and the rule of the emperor was absolute. Unlike the Forbidden City and its palace, the restoration of the Temple of God in Jerusalem was not a project built by forced labor or a uh, authoritarianism said a rule said the temple was restored by the free and cheerful giving of the faithful amen you know uh, it, it's one of those things that we ought to be willing to work together and I was so very thankful here uh, last Saturday when everybody came together to do a work to try to benefit for the church and I was very very thankful for that amen it's people working together not only is that the family of God working together, but it builds lasting friendships and unity. Never forget, it was when the people were in one accord. They were all unified. They were in one place. Amen? Amen. That the sound came from heaven, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house wherein they were sitting. Amen? That's when the power of God begins to move through the Spirit. Can you say Amen. Anyone who choose not to partake in the ransom of Judah would not be counted among them in the census. Therefore, it was a choice to serve the Lord and contribute to the restoration of his house. A life of faithfulness cannot be achieved without a lifestyle of sacrifice. During the reign of Joash, the kingdom of Judah would have been aware of the growing foreign threats. Yet, they decided to put their faith in the Lord and his ability to save. Though under the direction of the king, the temple was restored because of the collective desire of the people to honor the Lord. The people of Judah were not given uh, to a fruitless cause, but they were paying a ransom required by the law of Moses. They were given for the restoration of the temple of God. 
the temple had been left in disorder and decay by the three rulers prior to Joash. However, Joash's mentor was Jehoiada the priest, a man of God. It was the people's willingness to be obedient to the tax of Moses and the righteousness pursued by Joash and Jehoiada that led to the restoration of the temple, the house of God. We have to understand, the scripture tells us, without a vision, the people perish. Amen. We have to have somebody, amen, in the church. We have to have somebody that, that is a representative of the kingdom of God to cast vision. Amen. Somebody's got to be able to see more than what is here, but you've got to be able to focus in your mind what God can do, what God will do, what God is able to do, what God is in the process of doing. Amen. And if you have somebody who can cast vision, amen, and begin to impart that unto the church itself, amen, before you know it, people are beginning to have that desire to follow through and see that that vision is accomplished. Amen. That's working together, praying together, seeking together, trusting together, walking together, falling, amen, upon the mercies of a sovereign God. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. We've got to be willing to do these things. And when we are, things will get accomplished. Amen. Praise God. Since the New Testament was established, the house of God is no longer a building of brick and stone. But we as believers are his temple. When Paul admonished the church in Corinth that their bodies were the temple of the Holy Spirit, it was not just a simple metaphor. Paul's warning came in the context of sexual purity. To be sexually pure is to honor the house of God. This principle was true even during the time of Joash. So this is one thing that, and you've heard me say this on many occasions, amen, it is the example that the Lord has put forth, amen, he is the bridegroom, and the church is his bride, amen, so we work together, and when we begin to allow other things to come in and take the, pre, uh, take the place of our God, Amen. Whether it be, amen, working on our car or, or uh, working on our house or, or doing other things. Anything we allow to come between us and the Lord, amen, causes us to be adulterers. It causes us, amen, to begin to build a relationship with something other than God and we're taking that rightful place of God and allowing something else to commit adultery in our lives. Amen. It is a sexual tone, but the fact of the matter is, amen, that's how the Lord has established that we are the people of God and we are his bride. And anything else that takes that place, amen, causes us to love something more than our God. How can we say we love him when we allow something else to take precedence over him? Right? So that is what the Lord has put forth and even... The people of God recognize this, and that's the reason that Paul brought out that warning concerning the house of God. All right, in searching the scripture, Joash became king at seven years of age. Joash was the youngest king of Judah to ascend to the throne. In many ways, having a child on the throne was the reset, or was the reset the monarchy of Judah needed. Before the reign of Joash, the succession of kings from the line of Judah had been David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Azahiah, and then Athaliah, the mother of Azahiah. Among these, Rehoboam, Jehoram, Azariah, or Azaziah, and Athaliah had been unrighteous rulers because of their worship and self-reliance. Rulers such as Abijah, meaning the, the father is Yahweh, Asa, and Jehoshaphat were righteous. Amen. But through all of these things, there was a continual, uh, a, a continual realm of those that was worshiping Baal. And even though there was those that done that which was right in the sight of the Lord, there was a continual falling away because they would not eradicate Amen. The false idols, the false worship of Baal and the groves and things like that. Amen. They wouldn't go ahead and do the things that were necessary. And so when, when Joash began to be, amen, the new king, he was learned, he was taught, he was mentored, amen, by the priest. 
He needed somebody in his life that was going to reestablish, to reset the kingdom towards God. We have to have such a person in our lives today. I'm thankful that I can fall upon my old pastor, Brother Harris. He's gone on to his reward. He's gone on to meet the Lord. He's went on, amen, but he left an example for me to follow, amen. And I try with everything that is in me to be able to impart unto those that are under my authority, amen, to teach them what is right, what is proper, amen, what is acceptable and that which is unacceptable, amen, because God is going to hold us accountable. Jehoiada, he was that example before the this young king, amen. And as long as Jehoiada was alive, Joash done that which was right. We've got to have somebody that will toe the line. We've got to have somebody that will walk the walk. Amen. We're flesh. We can never ever forget that we're flesh. Amen. But somebody has got to stand up for what the Word of God states. Amen? Praise God. That's what it takes. And so, though Jehoshaphat was, uh, uh, was counted to be righteous, his decision to ally with Ahab, who was wicked, set up a series of tragic circumstances that ultimately led to a seven-year-old king. So we got to understand, even though Jehoshaphat was, uh, was right and God honored Amen. His sacrifice, and even to the point in time that he was fearful, and he began to seek the Lord. Amen. God told him, said, you don't have to fight this fight. He said, you just stand still and begin to sing. You begin to worship. Amen. And God stepped in and fought the battle for him. But the fact of the matter is, Jehoshaphat would not separate himself from the evil king Ahab. Ahab followed in the footsteps of Jeroboam, who first caused Israel to sin. And he followed in that same realm, and he, and then he married, uh, of course, uh, uh, Jezebel, and and these things kept on propagating. Church, we got to be willing to separate ourselves from wickedness. We got to be willing to separate ourselves from things that are evil. Amen. We've got to be willing, amen, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And church, I'm telling you, if we will submit ourselves to what God has called us to do, if we will seek the face of the Lord, if we will trust in him, amen, he will separate us from that which is evil. He will separate us from that which is wicked. Amen. How can you have fellowship if you're in the light and have fellowship with that which is in the dark? You cannot do it. Amen. Because it's always going to make its mark on you. That's the reason we got to trust in the Lord. Don't lean to our understanding because our flesh will lead us astray. Amen. Jehoshaphat allied himself to the house of, uh, of Ahab through marriage. Though Jehoshaphat trusted in God as his father and grandfather had done, his son Jehoram was raised under influences of the house of Ahab and the kingdom of Israel. Little information is given to us in scripture about Jehoram's mother, but his wife, Athaliah, was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. So when her son was slain, she worshipped the authority that should have been passed on down to his son. She took the authority. She took the rank. Here now, amen, is the daughter of a wicked king and a wicked, uh, uh, a wicked uh, queen, amen, and she is stepping into the place of Israel. She's stepping into the place of the kings of Judah, amen, that God had separated for himself. And now all of a sudden, you got Athaliah that is ruling and reigning as she was trying to establish. Anytime we mess around with things that are not of God, it's always going to try and establish a foundation, amen, to corrupt everything that it is with. This is one thing I've heard all of my life. Amen. You can take, you can take a barrel of good apples, amen, and you can put one rotten apple in that barrel. And it will begin to corrupt everything around it. And if you put a good apple into a barrel of rotten apples, it will begin to, to destroy it even that much more quickly. Amen. You cannot mix bitter water and sweet. Amen. Because it all will become bitter. Amen. We cannot 
fellowship with the things of this world and expect to keep our purity. Expect to keep our righteousness. Expect to keep, we are in this world, but never forget, we are not of this world. Amen. We are the people of God. And we got to keep ourselves pure. Amen. Praise God. All right. Joash did what was right in God's eyes. When Joash was made king over Israel, he knew nothing of governance. He was only a child. However, his mentor was Jehoiada the priest. Joash was adopted by Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth. Jehoiada was instrumental to restoring the monarchy of Judah to a path of righteousness. He taught Joash to pri uh, prioritize the laws of Moses. Joash's mother was also not of the house of Ahab of Israel. She was from Beersheba of Judah. When Joash was a child, he was surrounded by godly influences who directed him to seek after and prioritize the Lord. This is one thing. When me and my wife come to the Lord, now we were wrapped up in the world. We done all manner of things in the world because you know we was a part of it. But when we got into the house of God, Amen. We begin to allow that spirit. Once you once you repent of your sins, Amen. At an altar of God, God puts His righteousness in you. The moment you kneel down, Amen. You may you may look like a harlot. You may look like a drunkard. You may look like the world. You kneel down, and when you get up from there, you're going to look exactly like you did when you knelt down. Amen. Other than the fact that God put His righteousness in you. Amen. And the Bible says that righteousness leadeth unto holiness. Amen. Six months later, a newborn baby don't look like a newborn baby. Amen. It looks like a six-month-old. Praise God. The people of God, once God puts His righteousness, it's going to lead to holiness, and you'll begin to see a, man of, a manifestation of God's Spirit in you as you are following after the kingdom of God. People are going to be able to see the difference. You ain't going to look like you did when you knelt down at the altar the first time. Amen. And so Jehoiada was, or Joash was a babe. Amen. He didn't know anything. So he was surrounded by holiness, by godliness, by righteousness. Amen. So when we were raising our children up, it didn't take us very long to realize there were some things that they didn't need to watch on television. There were some things they didn't need to be looking at in books. There were some things that they didn't need to be listening to with their ears. Amen. We begin to draw ourselves unto God as Brother Harris cast a vision for us and we begin to seek and study to show ourselves approved unto God. Amen. Amen. There was things we did not allow them to participate in. Now I'm preaching the same things I preached when they voted me in. Amen. I just may may have just a little more shine. Amen. May a little more, a little bit more salve on it. Amen. But I'm still telling you, the word of God doesn't change. Amen. It's the same yesterday. It's the same today. And it's the same forever. We have to surround ourselves with holiness. We have to surround ourselves with godliness. We have to surround ourselves with righteousness. We have to surround ourselves with, with the things that are of God. Amen. We've got to separate ourselves from the things of the world. Everybody say amen. Hope you still love me. Amen. I love you all. If I didn't love you, I'd just say, well, let's just, let's just go to the ball game. Let's go out to the ball game. Let's go out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and crackers. Guys. <laughs> no. We got to be in the house of God. We got to be with the people of God. Amen. We got to seek the anointing of God. We got to trust in the Lord our God. Amen. Praise God. So Joash was surrounded by godliness. When Joash was a child, he was surrounded by godly influences who directed him to seek after and prioritize the Lord. Joash was brought up in an environment of righteousness. While Jehoiada was alive, Joash was a righteous king. It is important to surround ourselves with mentors who will encourage us to pursue righteousness. 
We can follow their example no matter our age or background. We are always able to draw near to God in repentance to pursue righteousness. Amen. It's going to make all the difference in the world in your life. It's going to make all the difference in the world in our family. Praise God. When they begin to see the change that's taking place. Now church, I want you to know, the ones that came against me and my wife the very hardest when we came to the Lord was, was my parents and her parents, her family. Our families many times are the ones that comes against us the worst are those that are closest to us. But you keep on walking. You keep on praying. You keep on seeking. Amen. I finally got the opportunity that I put my mother down in baptism in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to understand, you got to put forth that example before them. They're going to watch the change in your life, and that's going to make a difference in theirs. But if you just go on, you're that same old cabbage. Same old thing. You're the only thing you know, is like a... Uh, like the one guy said to my wife after uh, we'd been in church for a little while, he said, hey, 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 you done got religion. I don't want somebody to laugh at me and just say, well, they just got religion. You know, they'll get over it. I ain't ever got over it. Amen. Hallelujah. I know what I was. I knew where I was going. I know the life that I lived. I know the things that I participate. I ain't ever got over my religion. I ain't ever got over my walk with God. I ain't ever got over, hallelujah, the change that took place in my life. Amen. I know that I was a drunk. I know I cussed like a sailor. I know I done things that was unrespectful. Amen. But God brought me out. Hallelujah. He washed me by the water of the word. Amen. I came up a new creature in Christ. Gee, old things passed away. Every Everything became new in my life. Amen. And so can you because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Don't allow the devil to tell you you can't change. Don't allow the devil to tell you that you can't, uh, that you can't make a difference. Don't allow the devil to impart that unto you. Amen. That, uh, that that's just who you are. Hallelujah. I want you to know, hallelujah, that I, I could have run with the best of them out there. Amen. But God brought me out. Hallelujah. And he set me upon a high place. I'm on the king's highway. No evil thing's going to be there. Hallelujah. But the devil's always trying. It doesn't matter if you've been walking with God for 10 minutes or 10 years or 10 decades. Ooh, that's a long time. Nothing can pluck you out of God's hands. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. If you want to make heaven, you can make it. Amen. If you want to live right, you can live right. Amen. Hallelujah. But you've got to settle it in your heart. You've got to settle it in your mind. You've got to settle it in your soul. You've got to settle it in your own spirit. That I'm going to do this. Amen. Hallelujah. Draw an eye unto God. He'll draw an eye to you. Amen. All right, we must choose to do what's right, no matter our heritage. Athaliah went on to raise her son, Azaziah, to value the unrighteousness of the northern kingdom of Israel over the righteous principles of his great-grandfather. David, five times. When Azaziah was killed by Jehu, the son of Nimshah, Athaliah ruled over Israel as Judah's first and only matriarch queen. During her reign, she killed all the royal heirs of Judah. 2 Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 10. With the exception of Joash, the royal coup that had begun with the marriage ended in murder and sin. Joash, a baby, was saved by Jehoshaphat, daughter of King Jehoram, and wife of Jehoiada the priest. She hid Joash and his nurse in a bedchamber. He was hidden in the temple until he reached seven years of age. Amen. Praise God. They put him in a place, amen, that Athaliah would never look. He was hidden in a bedchamber at the house of God. In a place that Athaliah would never, ever Don the door of. Matter of fact, she had she had brought about a lot of destruction 
in the house of God. It was a place, as far as she was concerned, was off limits to her. So therefore, he was in safety. Now, I don't want to get too far here. I'll get into my message. God's a good God, isn't he? Jehoiada was a strong influence on Joash, but he was not the controlling monarchy as a priest. After Joash ordered the Levites to go about repairing the house of God, the Levites did not listen. Jehoiada was the chief priest, and Joash held him responsible for the inaction of the Levites. In 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse number 7, Joash referenced how Athaliah had repurposed the temple for the... For the uh, just a second, for the uh, idols associated with the uh, Pantheon of Baal. It is difficult to imagine the chief priest being content with the temple in a, in a state of disarray when he had the ability to make a change with the support of the monarchy. Years ago, we was at a church in Barberville, and, you know, that's when we was over at Wayman Chapel. And we had a, a gentleman that started coming. He was, you know, he was a brother in the Lord, and, and uh, he had been back sudden for years. And when he came back, you know, he had prayed and, you know, he wanted to come to church. To, and he told me, he said, Brother Thomas, he said, he said, you know, I would like, because we had some young people. And he said, I would like to be the youth leader. And he said, I've got some great ideas. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. He said, you know, of course, uh, Brother Jeff Shepard and his, his two boys, they were teenagers at that time. He said, yes, he said, we can come together and say, we'll have prayer and say, and we'll watch Monday night football in the basement. I said, I preach against organized sports. He said, oh, bad idea, bad idea. Some people, you just don't need them in a position. Because under the guise of being holy, they can plant things in lives of believers that don't need to be planted there. Hey, them become tares sown in the wheat. Amen. Before you know it, these things are springing up. And they can cause some undue stress that you don't need. We got enough things going on out there in the world right now. We sure don't need it brought into the church, do we? Amen. Because we got enough, enough devils that we have to fight. Amen. Just to, to keep the church righteous and spiritual and holy. Amen. Praise God. So we're going to do the things that we need to do, but we've got to stand strong for what is God. You don't mix it. So, uh, you know, uh, Athaliah, she began to instill some of these things in the temple of God, and it was hard to believe that that some of the priesthood they were, they were good with that, but Jehoiada wasn't. Amen. And that's what made the difference. And when Joash began to realize that the house of God needed to be be done, he told the Levites, he said, "You need to start doing thus and so." And they just didn't do it. We've got to be willing to follow the leadership, don't we? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the Apostle Paul said it. He said it best. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. And I'm asking the church to follow me as I follow Christ. But if I start preaching another doctrine or another gospel that's not a gospel, y'all need to send me down the road. Amen. You need to send me down the road talking to myself. Because if I start preaching another gospel, I'm crazy. I have lost it completely. So I should be talking to myself. Think that how it is? Y'all need to send me down the road if I start acting like that. I mean it. Amen. You know why? Because if I start preaching something that will cause you to be lost, God's going to hold me accountable to it. So 
So send me down the road. Amen. Because I don't want to only die and be accountable for my own So I sure don't want to go to hell and be accountable for all you all. You know why? Because once we get in hell, you're going to be pointing your finger at me and saying, You're why I was here. You're why I'm down here burning. You're why you didn't preach me the truth. For eternity, I would have to suffer with that. Knowing that I caused people to be lost. Because I will have clear thinking in hell. I'll know exactly what I've done. And so will you. Amen. So, you've got to have somebody that's going to follow Christ. And you follow them. Amen. All right. Let me find out where I left off. All right, Joash sought to restore the temple of the Lord once again. Said so, uh, said that he was minded, Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord in the New King James Version. It reads, said Joash set his heart on repairing the house of the Lord. The focus of this verse shows that prioritizing God is an issue of the heart. It would have been easy for Joash to maintain the status quo the previous three rulers before him had set. However, Joash did not let his heart go away from serving God while Jehoiada was alive. Second Chronicles 24 and 5 says, And he gathered together the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out into the cities of Judah and gather of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year and see that you hasten the matter. Howbeit, the Levites hastened it not. When the house of God was in disrepair, Joash made his repair a priority. All right, the Levites slacked at their work. When the priest and the Levite did not follow the command of Joash, it could have been an excuse to give up. If the priest, the ones responsible for ministering in the house of God, are not even willing to take up a collection for its repair, is there any use in repairing it at all? To Joash, the answer was yes. He has set his heart to make the house of God a priority. Joash held Jehoiada responsible for not taking up the collection. Joash cited Moses' collection from Israel to create the tabernacle as a precedent of the priest to follow. All right, the house of God and sexual purity. To understand that the house of God is a priority is to understand the need for sexual purity. The temple was in a state of decay long before Joash uh, began to rule on the throne. It had not been for the poor decisions of Jehoshaphat, had it not been for the poor decision of Jehoshaphat when he allied with Ahab's of, uh, house of Ahab in marriage, the priority of the house of God would have likely remained high. However, when the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel uh, married into the line of the kings of Judah, the gods of Israel replaced the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in priority. All right, Je Jehoram and the moral decay of Judah. The theme of the unrighteous and moral decay is pervasive throughout Scripture. The righteous men who were descendants of Seth were corrupted by women who were descendants of Cain. All right, Samson, whose name means day, was deceived by Delilah, whose name means night. And his last moments were spent humiliated with his eyes gouged out. Solomon, who built the temple and was given wisdom above any other man, also fell into the trap of marrying unrighteous women. So you better understand, amen, no matter how holy and godly you are, if you're not protecting yourself, you can fall into disarray. We're talking about church-wise, amen, hallelujah. Anything we allow to begin to come in and to manipulate our time, begin to manipulate our lives to where it separates us from our groom, which is the Lord Jesus. Amen. And anything that does that, no matter how holy and godly and spiritual you are, anything you allow to come into your life that will keep you out of the house of God, amen, causes you to be in adultery. It causes you to be sexually unpure. 
Because the only one we're supposed to be intimate with is the Lord. That's what we're talking about here. We have to have the intimacy with the Lord Jesus. Amen. We've got to love Him. Amen. And I'm not trying to be vulgar in any realm right here, but we have to make love to Him. Amen. He is our King. He is our Lord. He is our groom. He is the one that watches out for us. He is the one that sees us through everything. Amen. He is our provider. He knows the way that we take. Amen. He keeps us in time of trouble. Now, when me and my wife, we'd been married for a few years, and, and, uh, and I was in a, a Burger Queen. That's a long time ago. And we was in there, and there was this little snot-nosed guy I went to school with. And we was walking through there, and he turned around, and he said something to my wife. Wrong move. Y'all have heard me talk about my temper. That was before I was in church. And I didn't care. You see, the Lord's a jealous God. And when it comes to my wife, nobody's going to say things to her and me just sit back and let them do it. Amen. We got to be willing to fight. Amen. When we see the enemy trying to separate people of God, amen, from the Lord, amen, that's when we are to get riled up. We are to be upset. Amen. And just understand, hallelujah, I'm not going to let anything separate me from the love of God. Amen. I'm not going to allow it to do. The only thing that can separate you from the love of God is you. God will not hold you against your will. So you've got to, you've got to draw an eye on God and resist the devil. Amen? All right. We're almost done here. I've got about three minutes. Our ransom has been paid by Christ. Paul mirrored the theme of ransom when he spoke against fornication and idols in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 20 clearly reconnects the idea of being ransomed to Christ's work on the cross. By taking the punishment for our sins, Jesus Christ has paid the ransom of death and sin held against us. Paul's answer to sexual immorality associated with idol worship is rooted in the concept of ransom. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. If Jesus Christ has paid the ransom for the sins of every believer and the temple is no longer a building of stone or a tent, but the human body, then all worship from the body belongs to God. If we identify with Christ and we are more than his people, we are, we are also his temple. Paul's teaching is not directed to the indiv uh, individual, but to the corporate church. Sexual impurity by one member of the body has far-reaching impact throughout the corporate worship of the entire church. Amen. Anything that we do, amen, we begin to participate in worldly activities, it's not long, amen, until it begins to affect the rest of the body of Christ. We get ourselves involved in these different things, amen, it's not going to uh, be long until other people start feeling the pain. This is one thing that I, I've used this illustration for many years. When big timber fall in the woods, and we as as timber of God in the church, when that big tree begins to fall in the forest, it's not the only thing that falls and dies. But as it's going down, it's ripping limbs, branches, it's rubbing up, Stripping off bark and everything to everything that is around it. So it's not just affecting you, but it affects the whole body of believers. Amen. When we succumb to that type of a relationship. Amen. Hallelujah. It's basically just like when somebody is taking their marriage bells. Till death do us part. 
Amen. We're in this together. Praise God. To make it together. To go up together. And spend eternity together in Christ Jesus. Let's stand. Appreciate the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, to God.